Welcome to part 6 of lecture 1 of fluff body aerodynamics. So we've now introduced our conditions um, for which we can have potential flow and potential flow is governed by Laplace's equation. Um, if we combine the Euler equation and the mass conservation equations in, in such a way that we can eliminate the pressure terms we can obtain this very simple equation that basically um, from the fact that the uh, divergence of the velocity must be zero, we can essentially write this as the uh, gradient squared of the uh, potential, velocity potential is zero, and the velocity potential is defined, um, sorry, the gradient of the velocity potential is defined to be the velocity field. So this is Laplace's equation for the velocity potential. This is a scalar field from which the velocity field via the gradient operator and ultimately the pressure field can be obtained in potential flow. Potential flow is particularly useful for the analysis of external flows, for example flows around objects like cars, um, where sort of there's some kind of far away from the object where the flow is uniform and thus has constant total pressure. Um, because then we can say that, well, if the total pressure is everywhere equal to the free stream, we'll use the subscript infinity for free stream or far away from the object conditions. Um, so the total pressure is the free stream total pressure. This is equal to the static pressure far away plus one half times rho times the velocity far away. And that's equal to at any point in the flow, the local pressure plus one half times rho squared. So knowing the far away condition relates the pressures and velocities everywhere. And if we want to write this non-dimensionally, we can write this in terms of a static uh, pressure coefficient which is defined to be p minus p infinity over one half rho v infinity squared and using the above equation here we can write this for potential flow only purely in terms of the velocity field so the pressure coefficient is one minus v over v infinity squared now Potential flow is very useful, but it has some limitations. It's useful because it's easy to solve uh, the governing equations, and there's even some analytical solutions that exist. And that's because Laplace's equation is a linear differential equation. So we can superimpose simple solutions to form more complex flows. This concept is used to obtain the results uh, that we're going to discuss soon, later today. But first, remember that friction is assumed to be absent in potential flow. So right away, we realize that we cannot use poten uh, potential flow theory to tell us anything about drag, since drag arises ultimately due to friction. So we earlier derived the sort of di uh, differential form of the momentum equation in general. Let's look at the integral form just for uh, inviscid flow for now or for Euler's equation for now. Um, we can do this for a control volume just like we did for mass conservation. We'll do it now for simplicity, but it's really easy to add friction. We'll do that in the next lecture. Uh, and we attain this via the same approach that we use for conservation of mass. Uh, and what we get at the end is basically the integral over all the surfaces of the control volume of the velocity times the momentum flux across the boundaries. Right, so this, this is basically, or sorry, this is mass flux times velocity, um, and, and this is, V is the rate at which it's carried across the boundaries of the control volume. So this is the dot product of the velocity times the density with the surface, uh, no, outward, fa outward facing surface normals of the control volume. And uh, this exam, and then we have this sort of term here, which is the integral uh, over the surface of the pressure acting on the surface, and the sum of those must be zero. The pressure term can be usefully divided into sort of fluid and wall boundary regions. Right? In the equation on the previous slide, the integral of the pressure is over the whole surface of the control volume. But it's more useful to often separate this into a part uh, of the surface where the flow is passing, which are the blue boundaries here versus the parts that are coincident with solid walls, like the purple and red parts here, where this is a, some kind of car in a control volume. And then the pressure force on the walls give us the net force on the object. Right, so the blue surfaces are the flow boundaries, and we need to sort of know what the pressure is there. 
The red surface is the exterior of our car, and what we want really is the overall force acting on that. And then the purple surface is sort of the road, and we, we need the, the pressure there too. Although, as we'll see, it, it won't sort of contribute to, say, something like the drag force because of the direction in which it acts. Right, so putting that together into equation form, right, the pressure force on the walls is the net force on the object. So we have this flow term, uh, and we can basically divide the pressure term into the blue, purple, and red terms, and the red one gives us the force on the car. And if we were interested in, say, the drag, which acts in this horizontal direction, we'd see that the contribution of this purple term to that is zero. And that's because the P um, is a scalar, right? It doesn't have to rest. So we just act. Um, in the outward facing normal direction, um, e and uh, that's perpendicular to our drag direction. This idea can easily be extended to include uh, friction and drag. Um, if all the surfaces other than the solid boundaries are so far enough away that the flow is uniform on them, where so that means that the velocity gradients are zero on those surfaces, or very close to it, then there's basically no frictional effect except on the solid surfaces. So we can use that same integral approach um, to be could be used to compute drag forces on objects if we include friction. This principle is used in wind tunnel tests. Um, you can measure the incoming flow and the sh and the details of the wake or the flow downstream of your object, and from that you can compute the drag. There's a little bit of a challenge there with dealing with the effect of the ground, um, but uh, depending on uh, the setup, as we'll talk a little more when we talk about wind tunnel testing, you can, you can take care of that. So let's talk a little bit about inviscid flows or flows without friction and streamlined patterns in 2D. It's very easy to get the streamlines for inviscid flow from solving Laplace's equation. And in 2D, it's easy to visualize the streamlines. So the streamlines are the path through space that the fluid particles take. And they can convey a lot of qualitative, and if you're being careful, quantitative information about the flow field. Um, so this is the same picture I showed earlier, some sort of cartoon streamlines on separating on a flow. Of course, in inviscid flow, we wouldn't have flow separation. So let's look at qualitative behavior of flow. Basically, we can look at uh, four uh, things that can be happening that tell us what's happening with the flow. So if the streamlines in the direction of flow are getting closer together, they're converging. That means the flow is accelerating and the pressure is decreasing. If the flow, if the opposite occur is occurring and the streamlines are diverging, then the flow is decelerating or slowing down and the pressure is increasing. If the streamlines are curving, it tells us that the pressure is higher further away from the center of curvature. And if the streamlines are straight and parallel, it tells us that the pressure and velocity must be constant. Again, remember, this is all for potential flow. So in the text in section 2.2.3, um, this goes through some potential flow theory in detail. Um, I would strongly suggest this is a good section for you to actually go and read, but I'm going to give a few highlight key takeaways here today. Um, and this is because moving forward, we're primarily interested in bluff bodies for which potential flow theory is not adequate since it can't predict drag. So we don't want to bother getting into too much detail about potential flow theory. The first of these uh, important results is the impact of a ground plane. So this is obviously relevant for cars, since cars tend to travel close to the ground. When we have a ground plane, it amplifies the low pressure below a body. We can get in this important result from potential flow theory. The presence of a ground plane near an object can, produce, can reduce the pressure between the body and the ground compared to if the ground wasn't there and thus accelerate that flow. So the colors here indicate um, magnitude of, of vo uh, vo pressure, let's say. Um, so darker red and dark red is getting towards higher pressure, and then blue and sort of darker blue is getting towards very low uh, pressures, and white is kind of you know, nominal pressure, uh, free stream pressure. How do we get with this result? So we can get it by treating the flow as if it's symmetric about the ground plane, right? If we sort of if, if the distance between the bottom of the object and the ground is some, I don't know, let's just call it L, then if we put sort of 
another mirror image version of the object 2L away, um, then the location of the ground plane will be a symmetry plane of the flow field. And since we're not considering any effects of friction, that symmetry plane behaves exactly the same as if it was a solid wall. So when we do that, we can uh, get what would happen to the flow as if the, the ground was there, and we just don't care about the flow field on this bottom side. Um, and what we're going to get is that compared to as if this object wasn't here, um, the flow is going to go faster and you'll get lower pressures on the bottom as a result. The second uh, res result I want to th talk about is the isolated flow around a cylinder. Of course, the surface pressure distribution is going to yield zero drag, and we know this isn't physical, but this is because it's potential flow. But now, if we introduce the uh, theta coordinate, which is a ten uh, sort of tangential coordinate, starts from zero sort of on the back side and sort of moves around uh, counterclockwise, um, we can get the result that the, to the pressure coefficient is one minus four times um, the sine squared of that that angle. So what does that mean? Well, the, here if, if sine uh, is zero, then or if this angle is zero, then sine is zero, um, and same at uh, at theta equal pi or 180 degrees. So at this point, uh, and this is at the surface. So at this point, and at this point, um, this term is zero, and CP is one. If we look at the definition of CP, um, that means that the, the velocity is uh, a maximum. CP1 is the highest value of CP you can ever have. It means you're at a stagnation point where the velocity is zero. And then if we look at uh, what happens at, say, uh, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, uh, or 90 degrees and 270 degrees, the top and bottom uh, points here, um, what we can see is that that's where this term will, will have uh, magnitude 1, it's sine squared, so it doesn't matter if it's plus or minus. Um, so it'll be 1, and so we'll get CP equals 1 minus 4 times 1, so CP will be minus 3. And that'll happen here and here. And for that to occur, um, when we, we'll, what we'd see if we look at the details is that at, at that, those points, the velocity is 2 times the free stream velocity, and that's the maximum velocity anywhere in the flow field. Finally, we need to consider friction if we want to have realism. Right? Clearly, our physical experience tells us that drag around objects like cylinders is not zero. Friction is always present in reality and causes a lack of symmetry in the flow direction, and that leads to drag. We'll really treat this in detail starting next week with next week's lecture, because our focus again is on bluff body aerodynamics. So that's the end of lecture one, um, and uh, I look forward to any comments and questions in the discussion forums um, over the coming days. Thank you. Have a good week.